Hey guys, it's me, Professor D, and I know you're about to watch the video I did this morning on preterm labor. And again, I apologize in the video, but I just want to do it again. I went very quickly. I was rushing because I wanted to get this video out before I came and saw my patients. So it's not the normal uh, lesson that I normally, you know, I take my time and I go over. So again, I apologize, but I know if I didn't get that video out this morning before I came and saw my patients, you guys were not going to get this lesson for a good two, maybe even three weeks. So um, I'm happy I did it, but I just want to give you a heads up that I am going very quick. So if there's something that you didn't catch, just press pause or press rewind, okay? But I just want to give you a heads up that I was rushing to make that video. Um, Preterm labor is very heavy. The medications are very important. They're very heavy. And you will be tested a lot on those medications, especially if you're taking labor and delivery, you're taking maternity. So you need to know those meds. So I definitely will be making a part two, maybe even a part three on uh, preterm labor, the complications and the nursing interventions. So guys, let me know in the comments what you think about the video after you've seen it, but just please keep in mind that I was rushing to get this video for you. Thank you so much, guys. Everyone who has um, forwarded my videos to other people who've talked about my videos, who like and subscribe, who support my channel. Guys, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. And my channel is growing at an enormous rate because of you. So I just wanted to say thank you. And thanks for watching my video. Hi, guys. It's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering preterm labor and birth. This is definitely going to be a series because it's very heavy. There are a lot of things that you need to know for your exam. So I don't know how many parts, but it's going to be several parts. If you haven't done so already, you know you're going to like this video. Go ahead, like this video, subscribe to my channel, press that red notification button. So every time a new video is released, you'll be notified. Don't forget, guys, every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I release a video where I actually do questions, not lessons like today. I actually go over questions. I teach you how to answer questions. I teach you how to avoid the wrong answer and how to recognize the wrong answer choices to eliminate them. I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Now, for anyone that's asking which book I'm teaching out of this series for this particular labor and birth complications, I'll show you. Um, for this book, it's Nursing Care 6th Edition, okay? So let's get started. First thing, preterm labor. So it says preterm labor is generally diagnosed clinically as regular contractions along with a change in cervical effacement or dilation or both, okay? Presentation with regular uterine contractions and cervical dilation of at least two centimeters. That's preterm labor. Preterm birth is any birth that occurs between um, 20, 20 and 36 weeks gestation. Now let's look at this difference. I don't want to move on and us not catch this. Go back to preterm. So it's regular contractions with a change in cervical, uh, a change in cervical effacement or dilation or both presentation with regular contractions and dilation of at least two. Okay. Now let's jump over to uh, preterm birth versus low weight birth. So preterm birth describes the length of gestation, how long um, the fetus has been in the womb. Look at this guys, less than 37 weeks, regardless of the weight of the infant. So when we're talking about the preterm birth, we're really looking at the gestation time, less than 37 weeks regardless of how much that uh, infant weighs. Whereas low birth weight describes only weight at the time of birth, 2,500 uh, 2, grams or less. Remember what I told you about keywords when you're studying? Is it only one of those words on my list? Only, always, never. So you need to know that. And you need to know the difference between the preterm birth and the low weight. Now let's keep going. Low birth weight babies can be, but are not necessarily preterm. So they can weigh um, not enough. They can be less than 2,500 grams, but it doesn't mean that they're preterm. Low birth weight can be caused by conditions other than preterm birth, such as, and you guys need to know these conditions, intrauterine growth restriction, a condition of inadequate fetal growth, not necessarily correlated with initiation of labor. So there could be something that happened to the fetus while the fetus was in the womb that they just stopped growing. Okay, that's the intrauterine growth restrictions. Let's move on to spontaneous versus indicated preterm birth. 
Conditions such as preterm labor with intact membranes. So um, the water hasn't broken. Intact membranes and preterm premature rupture of membranes often result in preterm birth. So if that water breaks before that 37 weeks, that can cause mom to go into preterm labor. Let's look at this box. There's some very important things you need to know about this box. I'm using the camera that I broke. I have another camera. I brought a new one, but that one's in the car. And I only have 20 minutes to make this video, so I didn't want to waste any time. So I'm using the broken camera. So please forgive me when you see I'm moving the book and not the camera. That's why. So let's look at this box, guys. Risk factors for spontaneous preterm labor. What would put this woman at risk for going into preterm labor? And I put a star next to the ones that tend to show up more on exams, such as NCLEX, such as ATI, such as HESI, such as a lot of nursing uh, midterms and finals, especially if you're in uh, maternity right now. How do I know? Because I've been teaching this for a very long time. All right, let's go, guys. So what would put them at risk? Look at this first one. History of genital tract colonization, infection, or instrument instrumentation. And let me tell you something. This is why um, you know how like a normal patient, if they're not pregnant, but a woman, if um, she gets uh, your analysis and we may see some leukocytes, but she's asymptomatic, she doesn't go on meds, she doesn't get antibiotics. But if the woman's pregnant, even if she's asymptomatic, we don't see any symptoms. But when we get that urine, we see bacteria, we see a sign and symptom of infection, we are putting her on antibiotics. We don't want to take the chance because any chance of genital tract colonization, any pathogens getting in there, any infection that puts her at risk for spontaneous preterm labor. Look at this, instrumentation. Anything foreign going up there, remember anything that's foreign you introduce into the body, you can also introduce what? Infection, pathogens, right? So anything that we insert into the woman that puts her at risk for infection, so that can also put her at risk for preterm labor. African-American race. Just being a black woman makes you twice as more likely to go into preterm labor. That is a whole teaching of itself that I need to do for you guys. Um, history of previous spontaneous preterm birth between 16 and 36 weeks. If you've, if the patient has had a history of this before, that places her at risk. Multifetal gestations. If she's carrying twins or triplets or quadruplets, quadruplets is that a word? Is that how they call it? Yeah, quadruplets. Quadruplets. Tell me in the comments, guys. I don't remember. But um, that puts them at risk for preterm labor. Cigarette smoking, substance abuse, any substance, heroin, crack, you name it. Pregnancy, pre-pregnancy underweight. So before she got pregnant, if her BMI was less than 19.6 or before she got pregnant, she was obese. Her BMI, you can't see what it says, but it says more than 30. OK, so if she was severely underweight or severely overweight before she got pregnant, that places her at high risk for preterm labor. Periodontal disease. Well, Professor D, why periodontal disease? Because bacteria likes to travel. So it's very easy that if she has some kind of infection right here in her mouth and her teeth, that that bacteria can travel and cause an infection. OK, and also high levels of personal stress in one or more domains of life. Your husband's acting up, the kids are acting up, your boss is being a jerk, you and under heavy stress that can cause the patient to go into preterm labor. Before we go into this one, the common causes of the excuse me, common causes of indicated preterm birth. Let's take a look at this first. Indicated preterm birth are iatrogenic because they occur as a means to resolve maternal or fetal risk related to continuing pregnancy. What does that mean? That means these diseases, this disor these disorders, the only way that they can be cured is by giving birth. And a perfect, a classic symptom they like to give you on testing is preeclampsia. Mom has preeclampsia. How do we get rid of it? Give birth. Once we give birth, because what happens is the, what, what's causing her to be at risk of eventually going into eclampsia and having those seizures is that fetus. So once she gives birth, that risk is resolved. So that's what they're talking about here when they say indicated preterm birth being iatrogenic. Now we can take a look at 
this box. Guys, please excuse me if I'm talking fast. If you need to watch this video a couple of times, just do this. Just do that. The reason I'm going so quickly is I literally only have like 20 minutes. I got to pay attention to my time. I literally only have about 20 minutes. And instead of that 20 minutes just hanging out, doing nothing, I really wanted to make a video for you. At least start something that you guys can start learning about, okay? So please excuse me going so fast. All right, common causes of indicated preterm births. I didn't put any stars next to this, but let me take a look real quick. Absolutely, pre-existing or gestational diabetes. Now, that gestational diabetes, once mom delivers, she's not gonna have gestational diabetes anymore. It's that fetus that is causing her for that risk. But something else you need to know, and NCLEX asks about this, you absolutely have to know this. Any woman with a history of gestational diabetes is at risk for developing diabetes type two. Gestational diabetes is a risk factor for development of diabetes type two. You have to know that, I promise you see that on NCLEX, ATI, HESI, you name it, all right? Others, um, preeclampsia, that's a classic, let me write classic here. That's a classic example that they ask you about on testing. Placental disorders, such as placentia um, previa or placentia abruptio, abruptio placenta, I should say. Medical disorders, such as seizures. Patient have, again, preeclampsia, thromboembolism, absolutely. Obesity, smoking, <gasps> advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. Fetal disorders, let me see, such as chronic poor fetal growth. That's your intrauterine retardation. This is another big one. Excessive polyhydramnios or inadequate oligohydramnios amniotic fluid. So if the, um, there's too much fluid in the amniotic sac or not enough. And fetal complications such as again, multifetal gestation, growth deficiency, twin, twin transfusion syndrome. Causes of spontaneous and preterm labor and birth. Look at this guys, infection. Infection is the only, what did I tell you about that word only guys? Ding, ding, ding. Infection is the only factor shown to be definitely associated with preterm birth. A hundred percent infection. Women with periodontal disease have been shown to have an increased risk of preterm birth. Women who experience unexplained vaginal bleeding after the first trimester of pregnancy also have increased risk for preterm birth. The risk rises as the number of bleeding episode increases. Maternal fetal risk, intra, um, uterine overdistension, allergic reaction, and the decrease in the progesterone are also factors that play a part in initiating preterm labor. Let's talk about risk factors. Predicting spontaneous and preterm labor and birth, risk factors. Predicting those at risk for spontaneous preterm labor and birth includes identification of the risk factors. All of those guys are right here in this box, 17.2. You need to know them, especially the ones that I put a star next to. If you're like me where my brain can only hold so much information. After that, it's like a toilet. It has to flush some, some, flush some information out so new information can come in. If you're like that, make sure you start with the stars first to memorize. And if you're not, you're a genius, you can remember everything, make sure you know this whole box, okay? Cervical length. One possible predictor of labor is endocervical um, length. So guys, the cervix dilates and it effaces. So when we're talking about dilation, <coughs> we're talking about how wide that entrance is getting, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. This is your dilation, how big that circle is. 
Now effacement, what happens with effacement, the cervix will fold over itself, right? And as it folds over itself, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner because it starts very, very thick. It's holding that fetus in, right? But as it gets ready for labor, for that fetus to get out of the birth canal, it starts to fold over itself and gets thinner and thinner and thinner. That's called effacement because it's preparing for labor. Women whose cervical length as measured by transvaginal ultrasound is greater than 30 mm in the second and third trimester of pregnancy are unlikely to give birth prematurely, even if they have symptoms of preterm labor. Why? Because that cervix is long enough, okay? It hasn't folded on itself, it hasn't thinned out, it's most likely is going to keep that baby in the womb. I keep saying baby, you know what I mean, guys, fetus. I know I got to be politically correct. Fetus, fetus, fetus. I'm so sorry. Okay. 30 mm's. It's very unlikely that she's going to go into preterm labor. Early recognition and diagnosis. Although preterm birth often is not preventable, early recognition of preterm birth is essential to implement interventions that have been demonstrated to reduce the neonatal and infant morbidity and mortality. What is all these big words saying, even though there are many times we can't prevent preterm um, birth, early recognition is important for those that we can to prevent, look at this guys, morbidity and mortality, morbidity, illness, mortality, death. Look at this word, essential. Is it essential? One of those words on the list that I gave you, if you haven't done so guys already, please go to my fundamentals of nursing playlist. And I make a video, it's called test taking, no, 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 how to study, how to study in the nursing program. I believe that's what the title. And I give you a list of words to watch out for when you see it, pay attention. It's gonna be covered on your exam somewhere. And that word essential is another word for saying important. It's another word for saying priority. It's something you need to know, okay? So you need to know those signs and symptoms of possible um, uh, 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 preterm labor, okay? The interventions, include the following. Let's look at the interventions. And I'm not going to go over all of them. I'm just going to go over the most important ones or the ones you see on exams, I should say, guys. Administering antibiotics during labor to prevent neonatal group B strep infection. You know that. Administering antenatal glucocorticoids, such as your beta-methasone or your dexamethasone, to women at risk for birth to prevent re or reduce neonatal and infant mortality. And mortality. Admini administering magnesium sulfate to women giving birth before 32 weeks gestation to reduce the incidence of cerebral palsy in the infants. So these are interventions, guys, and you need to know those interventions. They're, they're going to talk about this uh, later in the book. I'm going to be going over these same interventions again, probably in part two or part three, more in depth. Because more than half of preterm births occur in women without obvious risk, it is, there goes that word again, essential. It is important that all pregnant women are taught the signs and symptoms of preterm labor. Box 17.3. Box 17.3. Oh. What happened to my camera? You guys, we're having technical difficulties. Let me see if I can pull this up again. All right. Box 17.3. And you see what I wrote here? No, with two exclamation marks. Signs and symptoms of preterm labor. You have to know them. And usually these come as all select all that applies. You have to know all of these guys. What are they? Change in the type of vaginal discharge. Watery mucus, bloody discharge, increase in amount of vaginal discharge, pelvic or lower abdominal pressure, a constant low, dull backache, mild abdominal cramps with or without diarrhea, regular or frequent contractions or uterine tight tightening, often painless, and ruptured membranes, her water breaking. Make sure you guys know every single one of these signs and symptoms in this box. These are signs and symptoms of preterm labor that we have to recognize and you have to teach a patient to recognize so they can call their healthcare provider immediately. So let's go back to where we were. 
Let me make this bigger for you. What time is it? In particular, patient education regarding any symptoms of uterine contractions, pain, and vaginal discharge occurring between 20 and 36 weeks of gestation must, there goes another key word, guys, must emphasize that these symptoms are not just normal discomforts of pregnancies. This is, these are indications of possible preterm labor, and they absolutely have to be reported. This is very important, this time frame that they gave us, guys. So if the patient is experiencing contractions, they're experiencing pain, they're experiencing vaginal discharge, they're experiencing anything on that list of that boxes I just showed you between 20 weeks and 36 weeks, they have to call their health healthcare provider. I want, to I want you guys to know what this number means. When you see 2007, that's 20 weeks, zero days out of the seven. And then this one is your 36 weeks, six out of seven. Okay, so I just say 20, 30, just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just to generalize, okay? The diagnosis of preterm labor is based on three major diagnostic criteria. So how do they get diagnosed as preterm labor? Here's the three. Gestational, um, gestational age between 20 and 36 weeks regular uterine activity accompanied. So they're having regular uterine activity, but they're also having a change in the cervical effacement. Remember effacement, that's how I told you the cervix folds over itself and gets thinner. Dilation, where that cervix gets wider or both. And here's the third one, initial presentation with regular contractions and cervical dilation of at least two centimeters. Those are the three how they can get um, diagnosis preterm labor. The pregnant woman at 30 weeks gestation with an irritable uterus, but no documented cervical change is not in preterm labor. So her uterus is irritable, but there's no cervical changes. We don't see any effacement. We don't see any dilation. That's not diagnosis preterm labor. How do we know? Look at this list right, right here, guys. These are the three quantifiers for preterm labor, okay? So even though that uterus is irritable, if there's no cervical dilation, there's no effacement, it's not preterm labor, but she should be carefully evaluated during follow-up care to determine whether she has progressed to active preterm labor, such as effacement, such as the dilation, both, okay? So even though, um, she's not diagnosed as going into preterm labor, we still have to keep an eye on her because it can progress into preterm labor. Women with preterm contractions without cervical change, especially those with cervical dilation of less than two centimeters should not be given tocolytic agents. So we're gonna talk about tocolytic agents. I'm, I don't think we're gonna get it in this season, but in uh, this um, section, but this is very important for you guys to understand. If she has a uh, preterm contractions, but there is no change in that cervix, there's no dilation, we are not gonna give her tocolytics. Why are we, why are we, why would we give her tocolytics when look at this, the cervical dilation is less than two, that's nothing. She's not prepared for labor. So we are not going to give her um, tocolytics if that dilation is less than two. That is very important. That is a test question. Make sure you understand it. So let's talk about lifestyle modifications. Activity restriction, bed rest, hydration, lots of fluids, and limited work are often recommended to reduce the risk for preterm birth in women at risk for giving birth prematurely. There is no evidence, however, to support the effectiveness of these interventions, and they should not be routinely recommended. You're not the one who's going to recommend it. It's going to be the healthcare provider. In fact, look at this. Both, both bed rest and excessive hydration, look at this word, it says excessive. So the patient does need to be hydrated, but not excessively so. Bed rest and excessive hydration can cause potentially harmful maternal complications. And that's why on the side here, guys, I wrote, do not advise. As a nurse, you do not advise that patient ever to be on bed rest. You don't advise them to have excessive hydration. That is not your lane. 
Okay, that's not your scope of practice. Look at this. It says that research indicates that bed rest causes adverse. Oops. Adverse physical effects, including risk for thrombus formation. You know that you don't move, blood doesn't move. What it starts to do, it starts to clot. Muscle atrophy, you don't move, muscles aren't moving, those muscles start to shrivel, right? Bone loss. You don't let me tell you something. You know what makes your bone nice and strong? Movement. As you move, that movement, that um activity forces the calcium that was in the blood to go into the bone and make that bone stronger. So you not moving, there's no incentive for the calcium that was in the blood to go into the bone and make the bone stronger. So yes, you're going to have bone loss, cardiovascular deconditioning, endocrine, um, endocrine changes, et cetera. So unless indicated, it's not something that we're routinely going to do. We're routinely going to tell that patient that you need to be on bed rest or you need to drink lots and lots of fluids. Okay, many healthcare providers now recommend only modified bed rest. You need to rest, but you can get up to go to the bathroom. You can get up uh, to make yourself a sandwich. Home care. Covering the bed with an egg crate mattress can relieve discomfort. Women find that a daily schedule of smaller, more frequent meals and activities, such as paying bills, planning, helping with meal preparation, et cetera, limited naps and hygiene and grooming, such as shower, dressing in street clothes, applying makeup, reduces the boredom, and it helps them maintain control of normalcy. Doing those things helps them while they're stuck in bed. And they're only able to get up, you know, just to do certain things. With modified bed rest, women are usually allowed bathroom privileges for toileting and showering and can be up to the table for meals. Before I get into suppression of uterine activity, let's take a look at this. Patient teaching, you need to know this. What to do if symptoms of preterm labor occur? The very first thing you're going to teach a patient to do, and this has been a test question I don't know how many times. The first thing, tell them to stop what they're doing. Whatever they are doing, when they start to experience those preterm symptoms, stop it. Stop what you're doing. Lie down on your side, preferably the left side to increase perfusion, oxygenation. Drink two to three glasses of water or juice. Again, lie down on your side. Wait an hour. If the symptoms get worse, call your healthcare provider. If the symptoms go away, still tell your healthcare provider what happened at your next visit. If the symptoms come back, call your healthcare provider. And out of all of these that I just mentioned, again, priority number one, stop whatever it is that you're doing. Make sure you guys know this list. That's what you're going to teach to the patient. Suppression of uterine activity. Okay, tocolytics. So I made it. Tocolytics. These are medication given to arrest labor after uterine contractions and cervical change um, have occurred. I think I made a mistake, guys. I think earlier I, when I was talking to you about tocolytics, I talked. I said bring you into labor. I'm not sure, but if I did, my apologies. Tocolytics are medications given to arrest to stop labor. But look, guys, after the uterine contractions and cervical changes have occurred, so what does that mean? That still makes sense. We can't give it to a woman who's only has cervical um, dilation of two centimeters. This says after uterine contractions and cervical changes have occurred. Look here, no tocolytics have been shown to reduce the rate of preterm births. Important contraindications exist to the use of all tocolytics. The maternal and fetal contra in contraindications to tocolytic therapy are listed in box 17.4. We're going to go over that in a second, guys. It describes the nursing care for women receiving tocolytic therapy. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I'm trying to find that box. Oh, it was right here. I'm sorry. Box 17.4, contraindications to tocolytics, when we would not give tocolytics. For maternal, if mom is in preeclampsia or gestational hypertension with severe features, if she's bleeding out, she has hemorrhage, 
If she has significant cardiac disease, we're not going to give her tocolytics. For the fetus, gestational age of 37 weeks or more. 37 weeks or more, that fetus will be able to survive outside of the womb because there's what? Surfactant. When else would we not give a tocolytic? Fetal demise, lethal fetal anomaly, which means that it's inevitable that the, the fetus will not survive. Choreal amnio, amnionitis, so we have infection of the fluid that's in um, the sac, and evidence of acute or chronic fetal compromise. All of these are contraindications where we would not give tocolytic therapy. Before I move on, let's look at box 17.5, nursing care for the woman receiving tocolytics. I thought there was a box with examples of the tocolytics, but maybe we'll get to it. All right. You're gonna explain the purpose and the side effects of tocolytic medications to the woman and her family. You're gonna position the woman on her side to enhance the placental perfusion and reduce pressure on the cervix. And preferably guys, you wanna place her on the left side. You're gonna monitor the maternal vital signs, including lung sounds and respiratory effort, the fetal heart rate and labor status. Assess the mother and fetus for adverse reactions to the tocolytic medications. Limit fluid intake to 2,500 to 3,000 milliliters per, uh, per day, especially if beta adrenergic agonists or magnesium sulfates being administered. Let's look at, um, let me find this box for tocolytics. There we go. I'm gonna go over this first, then we'll continue. Tocolytics for preterm um, labor. First one they talk about is magnesium sulfate. Remember, those tocolytics are given, we want to delay that labor happening so that magnesium sulfate, what does it do? It slows everything down. It relaxes everything, including the smooth muscles of what? The uterus, so you don't go into contractions, right? So magnesium sulfate, it's a CNS depressant. It relaxes smooth muscles, including the uterus. Now, let me tell you guys something. Something that magnesium sulfate does, remember, it relaxes those muscles. It also relaxes, because it relaxes the muscles, it also causes the blood pressure to go down. But we do not give magnesium sulfate to bring down the blood pressure. Yes, it brings down the blood pressure, but that's not an indication. And that's very important for you guys to know. It helps with bringing down the blood pressure. But if the patient is hypertensive, there are so many medications on the market that we can give her to bring down that blood pressure that doesn't have those adverse effects that magnesium sulfate does. So for testing purposes, please understand that, guys. We're going to give this for preterm labor, but we are not going to give it for hypertension. It just has a great effect of bringing down that blood pressure that we want, but it's not an indication for hypertension. Don't say I didn't warn you. So anyway, this is the action that it does. You have to know this. I suggest you guys make drug cards because you guys are gonna see these medications if you're taking maternity, they're gonna kill you with these medications. Adverse effects. For the mom, hot flashes, burning at the IV site, uh, the IV insertion site. She may have blurred vision or double vision. Hypo calcemia, where we see the calcium in the blood start to go down, okay? Some reactions may subside when the loading dose is completed. Here's some intolerable signs and symptoms. So if you're giving, I mean, excuse me, intolerable adverse effects. If you're giving that patient magnesium sulfate and you see them exhibit any of these, you're going to stop the infusion and call the doctor right away. What are they? Respiratory rate of less than 12 breaths per minute, pulmonary edema, absent deep, ten deep tendon reflexes, because you have to keep checking their deep tendon reflexes while they're getting the magnesium sulfate. Chest pain, severe hypotension. Why did they put the word severe in front of the hypotension? Because we know magnesium sulfate is going to bring down that blood pressure. But if it brings down that blood pressure severely, blood pressure is supposed to be 90 over 60, 140 over 90, right? It brings them to the point that they're now in hypotension, hypotensive crisis. You're going to stop that medication. Altered level of consciousness, extreme muscle weakness, urine output of less than 20 to 30 milliliters per hour. Remember the normal, the minimum we want to see is 30 mLs per hour. So you see it less than that. Those kidneys are starting to be affected. Those kidneys are shutting down. You better stop that infusion. 
a serum magnesium level of 10 or greater, they're going into mag toxicity. So you're going to stop the infusion and call the doctor right away. In the fetus, if you see this happening, you're going to stop decrease breathing movement, reduce fetal heart variability and non-reactive stress tests. What are nursing considerations going to be when we're giving magnesium sulfate? Make sure you read all of these guys. I'm not, I can't cover everything. I'm just going to go over the ones that um, I highlighted, but make sure you read everything. The drug is almost always given IV, but can be given the um, IM, but almost always we give it IV. You need to know that. Monitor the serum magnesium levels with higher doses. The therapeutic range right here, four to 7.5 milliequivalents per liter or five to eight milligrams per deciliter. That is your therapeutic range. Anything outside of that, the healthcare provider needs to be notified. Discontinue the infusion and notify the physician if intolerable adverse effects occur. This list I just told you right here. All of these guys are intolerable. All of these are reasons you would stop the infusion and call the healthcare provider right away. You want to ensure that calcium gluconate or calcium chloride is readily available for emergency administration to reverse the magnesium um, sulfate toxicity. Because remember, guys, as that, magnes that magnesium goes up, what goes down? The calcium. Remember, they go opposite sides, and this can cause um, a medical emergency for the patient. So you need to make sure that you have calcium gluconate or calcium chloride right there available at the bedside, bedside if you need it. Do not give to women with myasthenia gravis. That's very important to know. Um, more nursing inter intervention. Oh, sorry, guys. I'm moving on to beta adrenergic blockers. So all of that, guys, is for your... Uh, magnesium sulfate. Again, I encourage you guys to do a drug card on this medication. That's a very important tocolytic. Jeez, oh, it's 8.30. Okay, I have to go. Part two, I'm going to continue the uh, tocolytics. We're going to go over the beta adrenergic um, agonist, not blockers, agonist, your beta mimetics. We're going to go over prostaglandin synthetase inhibitors, NSAIDs, and we're going to cover uh, calcium channel blockers. So that's gonna be part two. Part two, I'm gonna go over those tocolytics and um, nursing care and interventions for those tocolytics. I'm so sorry, guys. I actually ran over my time. Um, part two, part two coming soon. Let me know what you thought in the comment section. I already know I went fast, so I apologize for that once more. If there's anything that you'd like to see me cover more of, let me know. Don't forget, I have audio lessons for you available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And if you guys want to do some studying every single day, you don't want to wait until Sunday for a new video to release, be released. I do questions every single day, guys, on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. Check me out, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will see me on the next video.